The text before us this morning is Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. It's what Dr. Johnson has called the Old Testament's greatest scene. A scene perhaps only surpassed by the single greatest scene in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and His atoning death on the cross, His burial, and His resurrection and His ascension. And indeed, this morning we're on holy ground. The language of our texts most certainly points us to that great scene. Genesis chapter 22 Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, and two, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. And I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord came to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. I'll continue to verse 19. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and not withheld and have not withheld your son, your only son, Indeed, I will greatly bless you and will greatly multiply your seed to the stars of the heavens and the sand of which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I didn't pick that hymn that we just sang, but um, it's one of my favorites. I'm familiar with another tune, but how appropriate that is for our text. This morning, God moves in a mysterious way 
his wonders to perform. Deep and unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. What a great truth for God's people as we sojourn in this life. All we have is to trust in him and obey. Trust and obey. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. The Lord is good. He works his sovereign will, his plan and bright design in the lives of his people are perfect. And all that the Lord ordains is right. And we can trust in that. So simple. So easy. Yes? No. Maybe not. Perhaps even impossible, but by God's grace. A brief outline for our text this morning. Verses 1 and 2. God tests the test of, Ad, of Abraham. God's test of Abraham is the severest and most anguishing of tests of one's faith. Never before and never again will any mere man face a test such as what Ad, Abraham faces here. Verse 3, Abraham's immediate and unquestioning obedience Verses 4, and ten, 4 through 10, we see Abraham's deliberate and confident obedience of faith. Verses 11 through 14, divine intervention and a miraculous substitute is provided. And lastly, verses 15 through 19, we won't be able to cover, but a blessing and a promise is reconfirmed the blessing immeasurable, a promised seed, and the true source of blessing to all the nations, that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Verse 1, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. After these things, it's, in chapter 22, we meet an elderly Abraham, over a hundred, a hundred, perhaps in, a, in the hundred and twenties even. He's been called and led by the Lord God to sojourn the earth. He was called out of his homeland to a foreign land with a promise of a great blessing. His name would be great. He would be made a great nation. And all the and Abraham and all the families in Abraham would be blessed. All the families of the earth would be blessed. What a promise. His descendants would be as numerous as the stars. He was promised. And Abraham believed in the Lord and reckoned it to him or credited it to him as righteousness. Here is a holy man. A man set apart from every other man that walked the earth in his day, in that time. Set apart for God's redemptive purpose to come and be accomplished through his seed, through the air. And now, Abraham, after all these things, is seasoned with experience. He has seen the faithfulness and providence of the Lord God Time and time again, after all these things, his sojourning has been fraught with danger, trials, he encountered famine. Twice his wife, Sarah, was taken from him. His nephew, Lot, taken from him. He battled at the risk of his own life to bring him back. He was promised a son, but no son came. And each time Abraham attempted to take matters into his own hands, it seems things only became more difficult for him. 
But the Lord was always faithful. And it was after all these things had taken place at that time, a time of ease and peace, that the Lord now puts him to test. And he is called by his name, Abraham. Immediately, Abraham recognizes the voice of God. Here he has come again, calling his servant, the sojourner Abraham, the Lord God, the great giver and the keeper of the great promise. This is the voice of the one in whom Abraham trusts with his own heart, his whole heart, and he treasures above all else. The voice of the one Abraham had followed for all these years the voice of the one who had always been faithful and true to him. Notice immediately he recognizes that voice. The voice is unmistakable. It's not a foreign voice. It's the voice of God. He knows the voice because he knows God. Intimately, there is a close relationship here. And Abraham readily responds, Here I am. Behold, here I am. You can hear the readiness in his voice. The voice of Abraham, as if jumping off the page uh, to our ears. The heart of Abraham here is eager to do whatever the Lord asks. He is ready. Here I am. To have that heart, oh, to have that heart, to be ready to hear his word, fully trusting in his word, whatever the Lord ordains is right, to follow him wherever he may command, eager to hear his word, eager to walk with him in obedience. To know the voice of the Lord, we must know him. We must know his word. And we have both. We have everything we need to know both him and his voice in the word that we hold in our hand today. Oh, what a great privileged place we are in. It's not complicated. We have his word to know him and to know his will. Far greater place of privilege than Perhaps even Abraham, um, who had to trust without the full knowledge of God as revealed in the scriptures. Um, and it's the heart of Abraham we see here. The heart of faith is put to a great test. The greatest test that any mere man has faced and would face. And never again would such a test be repeated. God's command that follows here seems to go against all of God's promises. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him. There is a burnt offering to one of the mountains, on one of the mountains, which I tell you. When everything seemed to be in the right place for God's promises to be fulfilled, the son of promise, the line from which Abraham's great mediator would be provided, had been established, the rightful heir of the promised nation was here. He was healthy. All obstacles seemed to be removed, as well as uh, a time of peace. Now it seems everything is to be undone. In a command to put the son, the promised son, Isaac, to death. Not a death by external forces or sudden calamity, but the death at the very hand of his own father, Abraham. His own loving father. How can this be? Notice the emphasis of each intentional word given in the command, driving the weight, the heavy weight of the command deep. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, he calls him by name. The name Isaac means laughter, but here there is no laughter. 
It's the first time in the Old Testament that the word love appears. It's interesting to see that it's the love of a father for a son, an only son, a son miraculously given through his barren wife in his old age. And now the only son, the son of promise, is demanded to be given up, even sacrificed, slain at the hand of the father. The connection here from the Old Testament to the New cannot be missed. Here is but a shadow. And if this causes you to recoil a bit at the thought, I think it should. It most certainly should. How could God, the creator and giver of life, request such a thing? Child sacrifice was common in the land of Canaan, among the Canaanites in Abraham's day, but certainly not for the righteous man of God. And not only was the command to put him to death, Abraham was to travel a distance, a three days journey to the land of Moriah to carry it out. The anguish Abraham must have felt. I can't help but wonder the inner battles in the mind and the pain he would have felt at such a conflicting command. It seemed to be a direct contradiction contradiction to all that the Lord had promised. Oh God, you have promised good to me, but how can this be good for me? Have you been there? Is this not the propensity of ourself in that moment, in these moments of sudden trial, when plans seem to be frustrated, our circumstances seem to take a turn, we're jolted, All seems to be going well out of the blue. We're blindsided with unexpected turmoil, a medical condition, unexpected, a relationship taking a turn, soured unexpectedly, a job lost, the sudden death of a loved one, perhaps painful trials of life. They come. They come suddenly. But did we not just sing, judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. But behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Oh, in those moments, but to trust in him to trust him for his grace. And here it is where genuine faith, saving faith, is put to the test. And here is the test of Abraham's faith. And here is where the depth of Abraham's faith is brought to the surface for all to observe in the light. For every age, for us today, To see. I like what Calvin wrote on this. For although the declaration of Paul that all the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen was not yet written, yet it was nevertheless engraven on the heart of Abraham. Abraham's affection of faith in the Lord God, in his complete trust is seen in his response to God's command, to the circumstance in which the Lord has placed him now. Not a word is uttered. Not a question of doubt is vocalized. Abraham's immediate and unquestioning obedience is seen in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey And took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. I won't make a comment, but except for now on the two young men that journey alongside him, they have no idea what the Lord is doing. 
They stay behind when Abraham and Isaac go up. They don't see what marvelous things the Lord is working out according to his sovereign design. But he works it out still. Abraham's faith, the depth of his faith, is made immediate, is made clear, evident in his immediate and unquestioning obedience. Though his heart and mind may have deeply been troubled, he obeyed immediately. Abraham knew the promises of God, but what he did not know was the way in which the Lord God would fulfill his promises. It was not for him to know how the Lord would fulfill those promises. It was simply for him to trust and obey. To obey the one who had given the promise. He knew the promises and he knew the one who had given the promises. He walked with him and he trusted and he obeyed. He woke up early in the morning and he began that deliberate work needed to prepare for that journey that was commanded. My dear brothers and sisters, to myself, we can only do this by God's grace through his word, knowing his word which points us to him, to his nature, his character, his attributes, knowing him, his faithfulness, his goodness, and growing in our knowledge in him. Psalm 119, verse 60. I considered my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. Now from verses 4 through 10, we see Abraham's deliberate and confident obedience of faith acted out with careful precision to obey. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and he saw the place from a distance. The place where the Lord had commanded him to go. They had now arrived. The time had come. The land of Moriah, the Mount of Moriah. There's great significance in this location where the Lord led Abraham for the place of sacrifice at Moriah. It would be some 1,000 years later in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. King David purchases the threshing floor to build an altar to the Lord, to make a burnt offering for the sin he committed by implementing a national census. A plague had come over uh, the people. And David's heart was convicted of his sin. And when he offered to purchase the, flesh, the, freshing, the threshing floor, the response came back that it would be given to him for free. But King David, the man after God's own heart, responded, I shall surely buy it from you for a price. For I will not Offer a burnt offering to the Lord my God, which costs me nothing. It would be there on the Mount Moriah at the threshing floor that David had purchased in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, where King David's own son Solomon would build the temple, where priests would serve and offering up sacrifices, animal sacrifices, year after year, day after day, blood was spilled and poured out from that place. The number of oxen and sheep that were slaughtered that day, in which Solomon consecrated that place to the Lord, is astonishing. Hundreds of thousands. And yet, Never satisfying, never ending that sacrificial system. It would be there in that region of Mount Moriah, Jerusalem, in which 
the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, who would willingly and obediently offer Himself up once and for all for the payment of sin. All that sacrificial system of the Old Testament, and even here perhaps foreshadowed, would be completely fulfilled and satisfied and atoned for in the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is here at this place that the Lord had led that Adam would, 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 would be required to sacrifice his own son. The place of great significance, the shadows pointing to the one who would ultimately fulfill that promise. For three days, Abraham had in his mind his son, his only son, the son whom he loved, Isaac, was dead. A dead son in his mind. But now he lifts up his eyes and he sees the place at a distance. In verse 5, his first thought is to go and worship. Worship the Lord God. He is worthy of worship. The one who gave the command. His words to the young men that he had brought with him reveals what, Adam, what Abraham had concluded on that three-day journey. Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham had absolute confidence and full intention to carry out the command. Confidence in the Lord. He took the knife and the fire the wood for the burnt offering was laid on the back of his son Isaac in the same way that the wooden cross would be carried by the Son of God, the Lamb of God, some 2,000 years later, perhaps even at the same location. And we get insight into what Abraham had concluded from the command of the Lord. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, the Lord God gives us insight himself and his word. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people from the dead from which he also received him back as a type. What marvelous faith. Never before has this been seen. And yet, Father Abraham, the holy man of God, set apart for God's redemptive purposes and through his line, through the line of Isaac, believed in the resurrection that the Lord God would raise his son his only son, the son whom he loved, Isaac. And so now with fire and a knife in hand and the wood on Isaac's back, they make their way together to the location. And now Isaac's voice is heard. First, first time we hear him speak in our text, still a lad, perhaps in his teens or even in his early 20s, he's certainly old enough to carry all the wood that's required for his own sacrifice, and most likely indicating that he's old enough to even overpower his elderly father. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father. He said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Here we see the bond of a father and a son again, united in faith. The father still teaching tenderly his son. Undoubtedly, many times, Isaac assisted his father in presenting the sacrifice, the sacrificial offering to the Lord in worship. The best lamb, the firstlings of the flock, perhaps just as Abel had offered up to the Lord in worship. 
the very best, and yet this time was different. There was no lamb. Where was the lamb? Abraham's answer, perhaps ambiguous, but confident. God will provide for himself the lamb. The Lord will provide. The Lord who commands will provide. He will provide what he commands. As we often hear, um, trust, a trusting obedience of the son Isaac is seen. It cannot be overlooked. They continue on to the place of the sacrifice which God had told Abraham. And when they arrive, Abraham diligently, deliberately carries out, continues that work of obedience. As he's done time and time again, he builds the altar to the Lord God. He arranges the wood with deliberate care. And there is no struggle from Isaac. No questions here now. But a willing son, Isaac, is bound and laid upon the altar in verse 9. Now, Isaac realizes, but there is no cry. All indication here is that the son willingly, obediently laid on the altar. At the very moment that Abraham stretches out his hand with a knife in verse 10 to slay his own son, the Lord intervenes and he calls Abraham not once, but twice. Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham answers again in the same way with ready obedience. Here I am. Here I am. Divine intervention has come. The hand of Abraham has stayed. It has stopped short from carrying out the act. And the Lord speaks, now I know that you fear God, since you have not withhold, withheld your son, your only son, from me. By no means does this mean that God did not know the faith of Abraham. He didn't previously know and wonder, does he truly trust me? Um, the inner faith of Abraham has been revealed in the full act of his obedience, the test was not for God to see the faith, but that the faith that God had implanted and nurtured in Abraham would be made plain and clear for all to see, for all ages, for Abraham to see the faith that God has wrought in him. Abraham's affection his embrace of faith in the Lord God took first place. To honor and obey the, and follow the Lord was of far greater value to Abraham than his, home, than his own homeland, than his own comfort. He treasured the Lord more than his own kin, more than his own son even, his only son, the son that he loved, Isaac. Yet his love for the Lord and his trust in him was far greater. It took first place. And now Abraham raises his eyes for a second time here in our text. He raises his eyes and he looks and behold, that word, behold, there is the ram in the thicket. And no doubt, to much relief, Isaac. Boy, the words of the Father have been fulfilled here indeed. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Verse 13, Abraham took the ram and offered him up for the burnt offering in the place of his son. The substitute was provided. Behold the lamb. It begs the question, what does God require of man from you, from me? What does God require? What does the Lord require? Where is God's delight in his people? Here it is quite plain. It's not in sacrifice. It is in faith. The embrace of faith of all who trust in him. 
That is where the Lord delights in his people. Abraham believed in God and it was reckoned to him, credited to him as righteousness. Abraham was not justified or made right before God by his works. He had nothing to boast in himself. Abraham simply, but deeply, with every fiber of his being, believed in God. He affectionately trusted in him. His embrace of faith was credited as righteousness. This is how God justifies the ungodly. All that I've just said right there comes straight from Romans chapter 4 in pointing to Abraham as the example of justification by grace through faith alone. The imputed righteousness of Christ. We are declared just before God through faith and faith alone. We are all guilty before a righteous and holy God. All have sinned and fallen short of his glory. The wages of sin is death. But here the substitute, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there it is. Perhaps a good preacher would smack the podium to, to wake you up. Behold the Lamb of God. God will provide for himself the Lamb. And indeed, the Lord has provided. The foreshadowing of the Lamb of God cannot be missed. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that was led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. John the Baptist saw his cousin, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he cried out, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We think of God's love, the Father, the love of the Father, for the love of the Son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It was through the perfect, sinless Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, who became fully man, who carried the cross on his back and laid down his life willingly as a ransom for many, for all who look to him on faith, in faith. The Lord Jesus Christ died in the place of sinners. The perfect substitute where we should have been slain under his eternal and just wrath. He was buried on the third day, risen and ascended into heaven. Risen, his payment at the cross was fully accepted by the Father. And he ascended into heaven, he will return again. Lift up the eyes of your heart. If you do not yet know him and trust in him, and behold, the Lamb of God is the only way of, satis of salvation. The only way for forgiveness of sins is to behold the Lamb of God that was given. We all know John 3.16, but it follows with John 3.35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He who believes the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the Lamb of God, is the only way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Do you know Him?
How is your walk with him? There at the altar, Abraham made a memorial site, a place to remember where God had provided for himself the lamb, the lamb that was slain. Abraham called that place, the Lord has provided. In the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Well, he's looking at it, forward looking. We look back and it is already accomplished. The Lord has provided the lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ, in himself, he instituted a memorial for himself, for his people to remember. The ordinance of the Lord's Supper. We aren't commanded to sacrifice our children. What a dreadful thing that would be. But we are commanded that the Lord Jesus Christ takes first place in the heart of his people. It takes first place in the seat of the heart of those who trust in him. And he has given the church a command, the command to remember him. And we do so at the table of the Lamb. The elements being passed, symbolizing the death, the body given, the blood shed for many, for me and you. Why did God give such a command to remember him as often as we gather together? I don't understand it fully. Abraham didn't understand why, but he trusted and obeyed. How we are to trust and obey in what he has commanded. Behold, the lamb has been provided. What grace we have in Christ. Unmatchless. What assurance and confidence that we have in what has been given, how prone we are to forget, and how much we are needed to be reminded that substitute provided in Christ and in Christ alone, and it is for his glory alone, and he presents and will present when he returns his bride, blameless, spotless, clothed in the spotless righteousness of his son, in white robes, the pure bride of Christ presented to the Father because the lamb that was slain, he will receive the reward in full for his sacrifice. Well, let's go now and close our service in the ministry of the word and stand and sing hymn number 28. I believe, in the white book. And then I'll close in prayer. Hymn number 28. Oh, what marvelous words we just sang, pointing to the truth of your son, the lamb that was slain, his righteousness, our sin, his robes for mine, Pray that you would bless your people as we go out from here. Lift up the arms, the eyes of our hearts to behold the Lamb, to behold Christ as first place in our hearts, to follow him, to seek you and your word, our affections to be spurred towards you to grow us in our love for you, our love for one another, our love for your word. Bless your people as we go from here. May we go in faith to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious 
presence without fault and with great joy to the God of our Savior be the glory and majesty and power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen.